Hi everyone, I'm Pastor Alan Hutchinson here at First Church of God, and I want to welcome you. Thank you for being with us this morning. We pray that our worship time is a blessing to you and your family. Uh, it's so awesome to have you with us. We realize that our online community is growing, and we're here to serve you. There's so many ways you can get in touch with us, so connect with us. We want to help you in any way possible. God bless you guys. Enjoy the service. Good morning. I heard two. Good morning. That was better. That was better. That was really good somewhere. I heard that one. Guys, we want to welcome you this morning. It's family worship. Say hi to all the kids, Kobe kids sitting around with us. First Sunday of the month is family worship. We love this. Kids, you got your green bags that are in the back, hopefully. Uh, anyone new this morning, we want to connect with you. Uh, and if you see anyone with a lanyard that says Fit Team on it, uh, find them. We'll get information from you. We've got a free gift for you. Uh, we just want to welcome you online and here in person this morning. You can also text the word NEW to 859-744-2387, as you see up on the screen, um, or also connect with us on our website several different ways. We just want to get to know you and welcome you in person. So this weekend is a national holiday. How many of you knew that? Alan knew that. Pastor Al Oh, and Pastor Alan's mama knew that. That's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> she knew before you. <laughs> this is true. Guys, we want to wish Pastor Alan and Michelle happy birthday this morning. church give them a round of applause this morning come on means church staff gets the whole week off from work to celebrate the national holiday yes i think so i think so <laughs> i saw that somewhere in my notes not really okay <laughs> Guys, we have an ongoing flood relief efforts going on here at our church. All of us have seen uh, what's been going on in eastern Kentucky and even more rain the past few days. But uh, we took out, I just want to say I'm proud of our church. Can we come together and say we are proud of our church? We sent funds from Faith Promise this week. Uh, we're taking up a special offering at, at the end of today's service to send down there. Uh, to one of the churches that was hit hard within our Church of God family uh, in Letcher County. We had a team of 11 go yesterday and work in Jackson, Kentucky and clean up, helping Samaritan's Purse with those efforts. We also loaded up, I, I, kudos 
to, uh, I have never seen someone load a trailer like, like Miss Darlene over here. I'm just going to tell you. I loaded up a trailer full. Guys, she's going to take another load so we can take more. So continue to bring in supplies, uh, cleaning supplies, bottles of water, uh, clothing. Uh, they really needed baby items. They mentioned that they're getting diapers and stuff, but they don't really have baby clothes. So if you guys got some of that sitting around that you can donate, help in these efforts. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of us as a church, what we've been doing. Um, they got down and dirty, and I've been told not to look at the inside of the church van. I didn't do it. I just want to say, usually it's me. I didn't do it. The church van is a little bit muddy, but that's okay. We're going to go back again, I've heard, in a couple of weeks. So hopefully that works. Summer of service, again, I am proud of our congregation. I'm proud of the way our congregation has been loving on the community through summer of service hours. We've got the cutest summer service picture ever. Looky there. Aww. That's awesome. Guys, we had a pop-up. We had our second pop-up in the park. That's a tongue twister. Pop-up in the park this week, and there was, we were guesstimating like 400 people showed up at College Park. We were handing out pizza. Uh, Craig had his foam going. Uh, uh, Chris had his balloons going. It was insanity, but you know what? First Church of God loved on the community, and that's what it's all about. Um, so that's going well. I think uh, we're a little over 1,800 hours, but I'm going to say that was as of like Friday. That's not even counting what our crew did in Jackson yesterday. So a lot of hours. Make sure you keep turning those in for us. We've got a wedding shower for Aaron Keaton and Mary Patterson. Everyone say, yay, it's about time. We'll be held... I've been wanting to say that on the microphone for quite a while. We'll be held August 20th at 2 p.m. here in the church gym. Uh, the women's group is hosting. Please join us celebrating this couple uh, as they head towards their wedding date. Mark your calendars now for a fundraiser luncheon uh, for our church softball team. Uh, this has been an awesome ministry that we've uh, been having. They are going to Roanoke, Virginia for a tournament, but the purpose of this tournament is beyond softball. It actually goes straight to f missions, um, so we want to have this luncheon as a fundraiser so they can go to Roanoke and um, help in the efforts for missions that comes through that. So the date, I told you to save the date, and then I didn't tell you what date it was. It's August the 21st. It'll be lunch right after the morning service. Guys, this month, uh, the month of August, that's when we traditionally always focus on our faith promise. And each week, you notice we started this last week, but each week we are bringing you um, a, a message from some of our missionaries that we help support. We are doing this as a prayer strategy, guys. We want to be a church coming together, a people coming together in prayer. Um, so actually, I'll go ahead and let you watch the video, and then we'll talk about it a little more. We are Daniel and Christy Kim. We are global strategy missionaries serving with the Three Worlds team in Budapest, Hungary. It's so great to get a chance to say hello to you and to thank you. We're so grateful for your support for our family and our ministry as we uh, serve here in Europe and the Middle East. Uh, we're grateful for your prayers, um, and we want to give you a few specific ways that you can be praying for us and for the church here in this region. So uh, to start off with, uh, elephant in the room, I suppose, the last half year, uh, we have been making regular trips, uh, delivering supplies to our uh, Church of God contacts in southwestern Ukraine, uh, folks who have uh, fled from their homes but are still residing in the borders of Ukraine, um, and we have been delivering food to them uh, to help them stay fully stocked and able to not only meet their physical needs, but also serve the community around them. Um, so please continue to pray for, uh, for those deliveries. C continue to pray for our Church of God folks uh, up there and elsewhere in Europe uh, whose lives have been upended uh, these last several months. We also have a really big event coming up in October and early November. It's called 3WLN, Three Worlds Leadership Network. And one of my primary roles is to help plan and coordinate and host this event uh, that happens about every 15 to 18 months. And so we had to pause it because of the pandemic, but now we're back and it's a time for uh, 
regional leaders and emerging leaders here in Europe and the Middle East to gather together, especially leaders under the age of 45. So one of our um, key foci, foci that foci. we do, focus. For, Just... one of our, the main focus points we that go. we have um, is to really identify and support and encourage uh, and train um, the next generation of leaders in the church. And so this is an event that we do. And so it's going to be October 31st through November 4th. Please be praying for everyone as they come. Um, we're working on helping them file for visas to attend. We need scholarships to help uh, help some of the countries be able to send some delegates. So you can be playing, please be praying for 3WON. Uh, lastly, we want to ask you to join us in prayer for our church here in Hungary. Um, and for the last decade or so, we've had two main congregations here in Budapest, Hungary, uh, and they are right now, this summer, in the midst of merging into one. Uh, there's a lot of things that are happening, but the, the leadership has kind of thought, if we combine forces, if we merge and have one primary worship place on Sunday, um, theoretically that can free up a lot of our leadership to have more energy and more time uh, to be involved in local ministries outside the doors of the church. And so uh, it's a huge, yeah. exciting thing, but it's, it's also a big transition. And yeah. so please pray for uh, the two congregations as they merge and uh, pray for all the new opportunities that, uh, that they're trying to identify uh, ways they can serve the community and be the hands and feet of Jesus here in Budapest. So uh, those are a few uh, quick ways you can be praying for us, uh, praying for the church in Ukraine, praying for uh, our church here in Hungary, and then praying for the Three Worlds Leadership Network event this fall. Uh, we're so grateful for all of you and know that we think of you and we pray for you as well. Thank you so much. Bye. I love these updates. Uh, it's a reminder, it's a face reminding us of what we're actually doing through Faith Promise. And it's also a reminder when you ask a missionary what is the biggest, most important thing that you can do for them, they don't say send funds, send money. They say send prayers. And so, guys, we're asking you each week, reminding you, if you'll place Daniel and Christy Kim on your prayer list. We've got cards in the back. Stick them in your Bible. When you do your, your daily prayers, add them to your list. We want to intentionally make sure we remember our missionaries uh, this month as we're talking about uh, faith promise all month long. So if you guys would stand and join me, we'll pray to open up the service, but we will especially lift up the Kims in prayer. Um, they're the church in uh, Hungary the Church of Ukraine, most definitely, and the leadership that they're doing. You know, this, is, this was their main focus in talking about what they're doing to create disciple leaders within that area, right, within the Hungary. So you guys join me in prayer. Father God, we come before you this morning. God, just thankful to be here, thankful to be in your house, thankful to be in your presence. God, thankful to, um, God, just connect with other churches throughout the world today um, through our faith promise. God, I lift up the Kims to you. Um, what our missionaries do, just, just uh, picking up everything, raising their family and some uh, other country, all the training that they do, but God, pouring into the people of Hungary and Ukraine, God, we just lift them up to you. I, I pray as a church that we can focus that it's more than just giving dollars uh, throughout the year to Faith Promise, that, but it's definitely something we need to remember in prayer each and every day, God, and, and lift up um, the Great Commission. God, it's what we're supposed to do. We're not just supposed to show up in a building on a Sunday morning and, and, and sing some praise songs to you and listen to your word, God, but we are supposed to go and make disciples. And God, I just lift them up to you, truly fulfilling this mission in their lives. God, may we... Um, just support them and surround them uh, in prayer and in support. God, we just, um, we're so thankful. We're thankful for a week of, of busyness, but God, mostly of, of being your hands and feet, seeing people within our church. God, I, I pray that we can just have our hearts open to, to serving others, to be in the church outside this next hour, God, but just truly in our lives and how we live and how we love. God, I pray that... Um, your spirit is here, God. I pray that we praise you and lift your name on high. God, I pray that our hearts and minds are open to you and your will for us in our own lives this day. Uh, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
you would, just stay standing. I'm going to let Daniel do the kick right there. Get them hands together this morning, all right? Come on, kids. I watched videos of you last week. You showed these adults how it's done. So you look at your mom and your dad. If they ain't clapping, you tell them to clap this morning, all right? I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not for communion. Would you be seated so you can receive those elements? Thank you.
spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night, night. I couldn't earn it. Don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Holy, overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. with us. Yeah. 
Aiden's going to be with me this morning. Now, you may be seated if you'd like to as we go to the Lord <clears throat> this morning with a, just a communion thought, uh, an idea. Of what brings us around the table really makes us one. It, it identifies us as one, doesn't it, Aiden? And Aiden and I have been talking about how uh, one of the greatest needs we have right now, and our minds are focused on what's going on in the flooding in eastern Kentucky. It's pretty devastating. And he and I were talking a little bit this morning and we come to the conclusion that when someone, their home is in disarray, <clears throat> been flooded, and they're in need, and we go help, they really don't care what denomination we're with, do they? <laughs> they don't care about what church group maybe we're with, that we're just there to help. And so he and I really have come to the conclusion this morning, that's what this communion meal is all about. We come here, this is what brings us together. This is what symbolizes our oneness. Sure, we have uniqueness. Sure, we have certain things that we believe in, and there's doctrinal truths that we hold strongly to. But one of those great truths is unity. And uh, as we come around the communion table and you have the elements there, that's the first thing we're going to do right now is we're going to take the bread, and uh, I want you to just take that and hold that out before you. It may be in the bottom cup underneath the, you've got two cups, the bread is in the bottom cup underneath. And when you think about unity, you think about how this oneness we experience in Christ, it's just like bread. It's like that loaf of bread, if you will. Uh, we're all part of the whole. We're part of the body of Christ, that bread. And the only time bread is really useful is when it's broken. Because bread has to be broken before it can be given out, right? And so this morning, we, as we observe communion, we're reminded how God has a special place for each and every one of us to serve and to love and be united together. Would you pray with me? We're going to pray over the bread. Father, we thank you, Lord, <clears throat> for the truth of your word that teaches us the bread represents your son's body that was broken for us. And then, Lord, he teaches over and over again about how through his brokenness we're made whole. Now, Father, I do recognize and acknowledge, God, our identity in Jesus reminds us that we're to be working and uh, serving a broken world, a fallen world. Father, may we be able to take them the bread of life, the truth of Jesus, the truth that makes us one, that draws us together. Help us, Father, in every effort that we have, Lord, not just in the relief effort that's going on now in eastern Kentucky, but, Lord, we identify with our missionaries across the world, specifically, Lord, the Kims this morning in Budapest. Father, we hear them going into war zones, Father, so bringing supplies and food and medicines, God, to the people in Ukraine. And so, Lord, we identify with them today, and we pray, God, as the body of Christ throughout the world serves the hurting and the needful, those that are in need and, and the dying. God, that the one thing we would never forget is what they truly need is the body of Christ that restores and makes whole. Father, we remember Jesus' sacrifice and what he did for us as we partake of this bread. Amen. Take and eat. One of the things we're also reminded of as we come around a table like this is his blood that was shed for us. We sing the song, What Can Take Away My Sins? Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. You see, one of the things that we recognize around the communion table is when we do this, we're acknowledging that Jesus died for each and every one of us. There's not one of us here today could ever stand before God without having his blood shed for us and forgive us of our sins. That, again, is what makes us unique in our faith and what we believe and so I'm going to ask you to just take the cup that symbolizes the blood of Christ and hold it out, and let's thank God for what he's done. Lord, we're reminded all throughout the Old Testament, you teach us again and again 
that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. Now, Father, we know that in the Old Testament, it was the blood of sheep and goats and cattle. But, Lord, to purchase our eternal salvation, Lord, it took every drop of the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, shed for us at Calvary to purchase our salvation. And, Father, we acknowledge that, and we want to proclaim that to the world. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Take and drink. Thank you. Thank you, Aiden. stand as we're going to sing one more song this morning. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know if you had a good day yesterday, a bad day, but this song talk, talks about how God never failed me yet. He'll do it again. So if that's you today, you need that encouragement. Let's sing. Let's elevate this place this morning. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me.
still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. Still in your hands, this is my confidence. So uh, glad to have the Tabor family coming to read for us. Good morning, church family. Uh, we are the Tabors. Uh, I am Joe. This is my wife, Mary. Aiden, Jonah, and Kelsey. Uh, Mary and I have been here close to 17 years, so this is us. Um, and this is not on the script, but I just felt like I had to say, um, as a testimony of God's faithfulness, um, last week we sent Karen Hadley to um, Poland to work with children with autism, and I just hate that she's not here this morning to see Jonah um, reading for us. Um, Karen has played a big part in our journey, um, and I know she'd be really proud of him. Um, Pastor Allen is beginning a new series called Growing in Faith. Today's message is Faith in a Furnace. Faith is that is untested can be unreliable. When our faith is tested, it grows more confident in the plan God has for our lives and ministry. Daniel 3, 15 through 27. I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we have to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods that you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his faith came that his faith became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them in the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them in the furnace. Fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire on the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego securely, securely tied fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped in amazement and explained to his advisors, didn't they tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar came and closed us. He could see the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Aben- and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their head was singed, their clothes were not scorched, and they didn't even smell of smoke. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. I could go on and on and the stories they inspire in our life because these stories help us understand how we grow in our faith. We grow through adversity. We grow when the heat is on. I read a story this past week as I was preparing my notes and really preparing for this whole series. It's the story of Gladys Allward. Gladys was a missionary in China around the time of World War II and Imperial Japan had just invaded China. She had an orphanage over a hundred children and one assistant. She knew they were in trouble if they stayed and she wouldn't leave the kids behind. So sure enough they made their trek over the mountains into Shanghai where it was called Free China or at least to get away from the war that was going on. She traveled, now imagine this, with a hundred children, one assistant for weeks. Food, shelter, lodging, water, Not to mention restroom facilities was out of the picture. One morning she woke up in utter despair. Little girl came to him and said, Miss Gladys, don't worry, don't worry. Remember, God was faithful to to Moses when he led the Israelites across the Red Sea. Gladys wept and she said, But honey, you've got to realize I'm not Moses. But this little girl said, Yes, that's true, but God is still God. You see, God's not looking for another Moses. He's looking for another you. So often we sit in the background and we're inspired by these stories of people. They say, boy, if I could be like Gladys or if I could be like one of the Tatmans or one of the Kims, if I could just be like Moses, that's the wrong way of looking at it. We look at their stories and we understand how their story speaks into ours and that we can be like them. See, God has a mission for you. Did you know that? You know, God has, okay, turn to the person sitting beside you and say, God has a mission for you. Now, for the rest of you, turn to the person and say, no, I'm just kidding. God has a mission for you. God has something he wants you to be doing. He wants you to be involved in. You see, God is still God. You can trust him in every phase and in every avenue of life. Now, when you look at our text this morning, you're reminded that most of the time, <clears throat> obscurity in life is much better than standing out. <laughs> Can I get an amen? I mean, you're reading the story and you're sitting here thinking, wouldn't it have been a lot easier for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to say, no, we love the Lord in our hearts, but just so we can fit in, we're just going to kind of hunker down just a little bit. Just make ourselves a little lower than what we are now. Maybe we'll just blend in. See, obscurity many times is much better than standing out. Are you with me? Are you following me? Do you, how many watch a TV show, Survivor? Huh? Come on, be honest. I don't watch a lot of it, but I've watched enough to know this. The ones that are left standing in the end usually weren't the ones making waves and standing out in the crowd. Are you with me? Obscurity actually worked to their advantage. That's because going against the flow is always more difficult path to take. Going against the flow will always be the more difficult path for you and me to take. And yet I want you to understand for a Christian, that's our only path. That is the path. You see, when you go against the flow, you stick out. You stick out. And and when you're in a battle, that becomes a target. 
And so you and I have to realize that's what God calls us to do as Christians. In faith, you are called to stick out. You're called to be different. You're called to look different and to live different and to love different. Come on. Are you with me? Have we forgot what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2? He said, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul says, here's how your way of thinking ought to be in your heart and in your life. We don't live according to the fashion of this world, the pattern of this world. As a matter of fact, are you ready? We're counterculture. We're counter-world. We live differently. What makes the church distinguishable in the world is not that we look like the world, but that we're in the world looking completely different. But we have something inside of our lives that inspires those in the world that's not in the church to be a part of what we're a part of. You see, that's the flow. You're called to stick out. You're called to stand up. You're called to be different. As a matter of fact, Peter said in his prayer, he said, you are a peculiar people. Translation to the world, we're a bunch of weirdos. We stand out. We stand up. We speak out. I'll go even further. When I was graduated from college several years ago, one of the bands that were so famous was the band Rage Against the Machine. How many Gen Xers in here? Remember that group. Yeah, all right. Now, I'm not going to go into the lyrics. Of the, I wouldn't encourage you to look at any of the lyrics. What I'm talking about is what brought that band into existence that many of us are aware of. Their first song was, Take the Power Back. Do you know what they were saying? They were looking in a world, and they didn't like what was going on in the government, in business, in corporate America, and et cetera, and so forth. And so what they were saying is, go against the flow. Don't follow the pattern. Go the opposite way, all right? Now, again, I'm not advertising for this group. I'm just hinging on what I saw them using in a worldly perspective. And here this is for you and me. We're called to be different. As Christians, you and I are called to rage against the machine. Pastor, what is the machine? Well, first of all, the machine is sin. The machine is unrighteousness. The machine is an unbiblical worldview that's permeating every area of our culture. You and I are called to stand up. What does our rage look like? Write this down. Our rage looks like crazy love. You see, we're not out protesting and demanding rights. We're giving up rights and washing feet and serving. Now, some of you are thinking, whoa, yeah, that, that, that's our raging in the church. We serve, we love with reckless abandon. We reach out to communities of people that we don't believe in and we don't agree with. And before we judge, we serve. And then we teach them clearly what the Word of God says. Because again, when you rage against this machine, you're not agreeing with the world's pattern. You're walking in complete opposition to it. But there's such a love and there's such a drawing and there's such a grace that people say there's something different about what's going on in their life. I want in on that. And they start following us as we follow Christ. That's what I'm talking about. As Christians, we're under tremendous pressure to conform to the standards of this world. And as Christians, the standard we conform to is the Word of God in every avenue of life. And it's not popular. And you will be going counterculture. Because we still teach and believe in the sanctity of life. We teach and believe in true biblical sexuality as one man and one woman. We truly believe that love for everyone and most importantly our enemies is what is the litmus test and standard of righteousness and holiness in God's church. You say, Pastor, that's abrasive in a way. Yeah, but I want to tell you something. It's true. And when the world sees that in love, did you hear what I said? You see, that's one of the problems. The message of the church has been, on, has been spot on, but it's not been tempered in love and grace and understanding. It takes both. But there's something I have to warn you about. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a decision to make. They had a place where they needed to stand. They had something that we, they were called to do. They were to stand up and to stand out. Their faith 
was challenged. Your faith will be challenged. You know one of the problems, one of the problems is with the church in the West today, our faith isn't challenged near enough to grow the way God wants it to. I'll say that one more time. Our faith in the Western church today is not challenged nearly enough for us to grow, or much less go. We live in a world of easy believism. In the 1940s, it was a great Bible teacher, Criswell, who was asked, the church is growing in America today, is it not? He said, yes, it's growing. It's growing a mile wide and an inch deep. You see, when you get into the depth of growth and development as a believer, it usually comes as a result of standing up in a way that causes your faith to be tested in the furnace. I want you to understand what faith in a furnace looks like from our text this morning. When you're called to stand out, when you're called to be different, when you're called to go against the flow, when you're called into the carpet of the world's culture around us and you refuse to bend or bow or to follow any other agenda than Jesus and the Scripture, here comes the fire. Today, I want you to understand that faith in a furnace looks like this. Faith is rooted in God's Word. It's first and foremost rooted in God's Word. It's not my opinion or your opinion or what a theologian said or what the latest uh, communicator on religious TV is broadcasting. It's thus saith the Lord. Look at verse 16. They said, basically, we don't need to defend ourselves. Let me give you my translation. I don't need to pray about this. I don't have to go away and think about this. I don't have to actually contemplate what we're going to do. Oh, King, if you'll give us just a few minutes, let us go over in a huddle, and we're going to pray about whether or not we're going to bow down before this statue. They didn't have to do that, did they? These three men didn't have to justify or apologize for their actions. They were willing to stand up before this king and face the consequences because they knew they were standing on absolute truth. They didn't need to debate this matter with the latest celebrity TV. They didn't go to Ellen's show. They didn't have to go to The View. They didn't have to contemplate, is bowing down before uh, an idol, is it right, is it wrong, yes or no. You want to know why they didn't have to debate it? Because they knew what the Word of God says. I look at Christians today in a world around us of unrighteousness, and it's like we've lost our voice on moral matters When the Bible clearly teaches what we do, we stand on God's Word. Our faith is rooted in the Word of God. See, these men knew that they weren't going to bow down before that statue because they knew that was against the Word of God. How did they know that? They remember the first commandment. You shall have no other God before me. You said they'd already crossed that avenue. They weren't going to indulge in idol worship. We have three young men who are in a pagan culture of Babylon where everything in the world was offered to them and they stood up in the culture of that day and the king of the day, most powerful man in the world, and defied him because what he was asking them to do went against God's word. You say, Pastor, that was way back then. Thank goodness that was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Friends, what will that be like if it's us? It's it's, it's pretty sobering when you think about it. Well, how did they know that that they weren't supposed to bow down before a false god? It's because the Word of God says it. Their faith was based on God's Word. Now, over the years, I've had many people, like you have, try to debate our faith. They ask questions like, how do you know that you can be sure that you're right? And how do you know that what you believe in is true? How many times have you had those questions asked to you? If you haven't, you're going to. If you haven't, go ahead and contemplate them. That's going through people's minds. And the reason we believe what we believe, and the reason we believe it is true, is because we believe the Bible we hold in our hands is the absolute Word of God. And God is correct in what He says. It doesn't need debate. It doesn't need contemplation. We've had theologians that can stack warehouses full of volumes talking about one book in the Bible. Isn't it amazing that people of simple faith can change the world? Why? Because they just simply believe the Bible's true. That faith is built on the Word of God. Jesus knew this. 
We're following Jesus' example in this. Remember Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, when Jesus was placed in the wilderness in a time of temptation? Remember when the devil comes to him? Let's read it. Then Jesus, led by the Spirit, went into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Let me tell you something. Did you hear that? 40 days and 40 nights. Not 40 hours and 40 minutes. That's usually when I get hungry. He was hungry. And what does the enemy do? comes to him and says, look at those stones. Tell those stones to become bread. Notice how Jesus answered. It is written. Man shall not live on the things of this world alone. Bread alone. But on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. What's Jesus saying? Everything you and I need to live by and to grow by and to grow in our faith through is through the Word of God. It is written. Faith that is in a furnace, faith that is tried and tested, has to be a faith that's rooted in the Word of God. I'm going to go one step further and I'm moving on. If your faith is not founded on the Word of God, you will be shaken to the foundation of your being. When it comes time to answer the difficult questions, well, what do you believe about? When it comes to answer the circumstances of righteousness and people around you, and you know when you give your answer, it's going to be offensive. If you can't stand, that faith slowly melts because it's not rooted in the Word of God. Also, faith that faces a furnace is a faith and realize, it realizes how life has its wounds. This kind of faith realizes how life has its It's woundedness. We don't live in a perfect world. There are wounds. There is suffering. There is sorrow. There is hardships. Verse 17, these these three young men says, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, we want to tell you something. We'll never change our mind. You throw us in there, whether God delivers us or not, we're not going to bend. And we're not going to bow to you. They realized it could cost them something. They realized it could cost them their lives. You need to see clearly how these men understood that disobeying the king uh, could be sudden death. They knew if they willingly disobeyed him, they knew exactly what this king could do. And he did. You see, one of the reasons so many people today turn away from the faith, one of the reasons so many people today turn their backs on God, is they've mistakenly believed that being a Christian means everything in your life is going to be taken care of. And everything in your life is going to be okay. No hardships, no problems, no storms, no troubles, no issues, no difficulties. How many times have you seen it? Come on. You see people who judge whether or not they're going to be faithful to God, whether they're going to serve God, is if everything comes up right in my life and there's never any suffering, there's never any problems, I get the job, I get the raise, everyone's healthy, wealthy, and wise, and we live all live happily ever after. Let me tell you something. That doesn't wash in this world. That doesn't wash in reality. If you think that, you're living in denial. You want me to tell you why you're living in denial? Because this life is hard, and there's a lot of stuff happens that's terrible. There's a lot of bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. And you and I are left with our arms out like this wondering, I don't understand any of this. You see, genuine faith realizes there's wounds in this world. There's things that happen that you never wanted to happen. There's prayers you prayed that you knew was going to be answered. There was things you asked for that you claimed it in Jesus' name and heaven was silent. And now you're right here going, what do I do next? Where do I go next? Well, my question would be a reversal. Where can you go? Where else is there to go? Who else is there to turn to? What other alternative is, there? alternative is there? You see, Jesus wanted his disciples then and now to realize what he said in John chapter 16, verse 33. He plainly said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now stop right there. If you're searching for peace in anything other than Jesus Christ, you need to listen to me. You will one day lift up your eyes and realize what you were depending on was foolishness and pride. There's only one thing that will bring peace into your life, and it's when you bow your will to the Lord Jesus Christ and you tell him these words. It doesn't matter what you require. It doesn't matter where you call me. It doesn't matter what you want me to do. I am yours, and you are mine. Boom! That's the faith 
that moves mountains. And until you reach that level, you're never going to know how bad the furnace can get. In this life, in me, you will have peace. In this world, notice that if notice you have me, you have peace. If you're in the world looking for it, guess what you got? Say it. Trouble, tribulation, trials. Now, most people look at that as Christians and say, okay, in Jesus we have peace, so we're in Jesus, so we don't have trouble in the world. No, no, no. <laughs> you want to know why you're included in this? Because you and I are still in the world. Huh? When you go to work tomorrow morning, when you get up tomorrow morning, wh wherever you are this week, you're going to have the same troubles and trials everyone else has. But here's the key. Because of the peace you have in Jesus Christ, he's overcome the world. Amen. And so right in the midst of the raging storms of life, when you're trying to get away from all that's hounding you and harassing you, and you know what? People are submerging themselves in a lot of things to try to get away from reality. Have you noticed that? Has anyone noticed that? Do you know there's something that probably you're holding in your hand right now? Hopefully it's got your Bible pulled up on it called your cell phone, your iPad, mobile devices. They call them smart devices. I would debate that. And what are they? They become bondage to you to pull you out of the reality and hopefully get into a false sense of hope, a false sense of security, a false sense of connecting. I know people that have a bazillion Facebook friends and they never get out and see the sunlight. We have a world of people that's living in denial. We have a world of people that's trying to create a false narrative that they're living in. And they're wondering, where's the peace? Jesus has let me down. Where's the church? You see, there comes a time in your life and in my life where we have to just recognize that bad things are going to happen to good people. Good things are going to happen to bad people. Here's what Jesus said. I've told you all of these things before it happened. Jesus said, I'm giving you a heads up before this takes place. But in me, you'll have peace and you'll overcome the world. Paul said the same thing in 2 Timothy, in his second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. There's the reality. That's why when you stand for truth, that's when you live by the Word of God. When your faith is in the furnace and people look at you and wonder, what's wrong with them? You can stand up and say, I serve Jesus. I love Him more than anything else in this world. I love Him more than my reputation. I love Him more than what you think about me. I love Him more than getting ahead in things in life. As a matter of fact, as long as I'm climbing in the kingdom and growing in my faith, everything else in this world will just happen. Because one day, listen to me, one day, listen, listen, one day this world's going to pass away. One day this world is going to be over. One day the reality is, it is over, it is the end. My question is, where will you spend eternity? You see, that's where rubber meets the road. Because you and I live in this area in our lives where we have to understand there's such thing as a fallen nature. The fallen nature of mankind, the sin nature that we've inherited. And until we find peace in Jesus Christ, until we place our faith in Him, and our faith has been tried and refined, it's not going to stand when the heat is on. Now let me turn the corner. Because the exciting truth about faith in the furnace is how faith remembers God's works. You see, now God comes into the picture. The first thing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to do, they had to stand on the Word of God before they heard anything from, from God. Before they, heard, uh, before they felt their bonds fall away in the fire and they were saved, they had to first of all stand on the Word of God. And then they had to realize what it could cost them. Wounds come when you live by faith. But also this faith in the furnace remembers the works of God. Look at verse, six, verse 17. We read this bold declaration, God is able to save us, and He will rescue us. Now, here's my question, and we're going to talk about it in the next, last point, the will of God. What is the will of God for your life? You see, they knew that God was with them, and God will rescue them. And the essential part of our faith is remembering that God is willing and God is able to save you. In your unbelief, in your uncertainty, in your questions of whether or not He even exists, 
he can still save you and he wants to save you and me and everyone in this world. God is for us. God is on our side. God is working to our good. God's power and love are the foundation of our life. His goodness and His faithfulness are a mighty part of who He is. Listen to what Ralph Waldo Emerson said, certainly the furthest thing from a theologian, but listen to what he says. All I have seen teaches me to trust the Creator for all I have not seen. What's he saying? Well, I'm looking around just looking at creation. I can't explain to you how that happened, but I know it had to be someone that's far beyond what I understand. All I have seen teaches me to trust in the Creator for all that I have not seen. Theologian Cliff Richards said, the more we depend on God, the more we uh, depend, uh, see, I'm sorry, the more we depend on God, the more dependable we find He is. God is trustworthy. He's dependable. He's faithful. In other words, you can trust the Father. When our kids were growing up, one of the games they loved to use to play, well, one of them did in particular, is I grab them. They were little guys, not now. <laughs> about, about Noah's size. I'd take them in my arms, and I'd throw them up. How many of you dads ever played that? That's a Gen X game, by the way. Millennials quit doing that a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, Brad loved it. I couldn't throw him high enough to satisfy him. Brandon, it, he didn't like that game as well. And I didn't drop him, by the way. But I seriously would take... <laughs> but seriously, I'd take Brad, and I mean, I'd literally throw him in the air. And he was just as happy as a lark. He was just limp as could be. He'd come down. Of course, I'd break the fall by catching him high. He just loved it. One day I was doing that in the church, and there was a lady came in. <laughs> she shook her head. She said, can you explain to me why Bradley is so relaxed when he seems to be so out of control? And I thought about that. I thought there's a biblical point here. I've used this before. And I thought it's pretty simple. We have a history together. We played this game more than once. We've done this over and over again. And I've never dropped him yet. That's the thought came to my mind. And there's times in my life and in your life when this world will throw us for a spin. There'll be times in your life you feel like you're free falling. Come on. Someone say amen. You see, Christians know where I am. Those of you who've been in the furnace, you know what I'm talking about. There's moments in your life you don't know where to turn or what to do, but you trust in the hands of God because He's never failed us yet. And let me say, He's never going to fail you. Pastor, are you serious? Yeah, let's move on to the next point because here it is. Faith in the furnace is faith that's resting in God's will. Faith in the furnace is a faith that's resting in God's will. I've had people tell me, Pastor, can you explain to me the will of God? They're talking about the absolute perfect will of God. And I'm like, sure, I can explain it to you. But we need 10 million lifetimes to, in order for me to scratch the surface of my introduction. They say, well, that sounds impossible. No, it's eternal. You're asking an eternal question in the confines of time. You're asking a question that will only be understood when we get to be in the presence of the Lord, when you want to talk about the absolute will of God, the perfect will of God. Now, there is the permissible will of God. God gives you a free will. God gives you the ability to make choices. God gives you the ability right now, every single one of us, to determine how we're going to live our life. Will we serve God? Will we love God? Will we grow in our faith? Will we bring our family to church? Will we be you know, committed to kingdom principles? Will we do what we're called to do? Will we believe in the Word of God even when it would cost us something? Or will we choose not to? So there's the permissible will of God. Then I also believe there is a specific will of God or a revealed will of God, if you will, revelation. You see, on April the 12th, 1993, there's no question in my mind what God wanted me to do with the rest of my life. He placed a definite calling on my life to ministry. I go back to that over and over again. Had it not been for that moment, I wouldn't be here right now. Because I want to tell you, you go into ministry. I'm, I'm, I'm looking 30 years back down the road. There's some of you look further back than that. But I'm telling you, 
to be in ministry, you're going to be in a furnace. Uh, let me just go one step further. If you walk outside the doors of this church and say, I'm a Christian, I believe the Word of God is true, and everything that it says and teaches, get ready. You're going to into the furnace. But I believe in the will of God. It's an expressed or a revealed will to you and me. Let me summarize the will of God for you in its entirety. It's all that is or ever will be. How's that? It's all that is or ever will be. That's God's will. Pastor, can you explain it? Sure. Give me 10 million lifetimes. You see, there's some things you'll only understand when you hear, well done, good and faithful servant. There's been prayers I've prayed that I knew, I knew God was going to answer. And then three weeks later, I was at a funeral. Do I, do I lose faith in God because of that? No. Here's what I understand. One day, if I keep loving him and serving him, all the pieces of this giant jigsaw puzzle of life is going to come together. You see, you and I are just a small part of this puzzle of God. We're, we're just a small part of this masterpiece. We're, we're just a small part of this symphony. We, we all come together in faith and play that role together in this great symphonic masterpiece that God is going to reveal on the last day when we're gathered around the throne of God at the marriage feast of the Lamb and we sing the song that the angels cannot sing saved by grace worthy is the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world to receive glory and power and honor forever and ever Amen that's when you'll step back and realize so that's what it looks like, yeah. You see, that's why that's the hardest part of faith. That's why it's the most difficult part of faith. I follow God, resting and understanding His will may not be revealed to me. But let me ask you a question. I'm going to move on quick. Yeah, I'm going to move on quick. <laughs> Some of you hear your stomachs growling from here. If I could explain... In a 35-minute sermon, everything there is to know about God, how disappointed would you be? I know I would be. I can't explain God to you. I stopped, by the way, I stopped trying to explain God to people. He is God. I believe it. It's part of faith. That's why our faith goes through the furnace. And it's refined over and over again. And do you know what happens when your faith goes into the furnace? you know what gets burned away? Alan's ideas. Alan's opinions, Alan's theories, Alan's thoughts. Matter of fact, after 30 years of ministry, I know very little than I did when I first started. <laughs> when I first started in ministry, I thought, man, I want to change the world. If they'll just listen to me for five minutes, it's going to be bingo, right? 30 years down the road, I'm sitting here going, God, I don't have a clue what's going on here, but I trust in you now more than ever. Some of you are smiling because you know you're there. And that's the joy of it, isn't it? Isn't that the mysterious joy of God's will? Isn't that the beauty? I don't know how this is going to figure out, but I know I'm a part of it. And here's what else I know. I'm going to stay a part of it. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving God. I'm not doubting His will. I'm not doubting His power. I'm not doubting His purpose. I'm not doubting His people. If I'm in trouble, you the guys I'm coming to because I trust in your prayers. I trust in your faith. I trust in you because I know you've been through what I've gone through. And it's this faith that draws us together and keeps us strong. Amen? And the church said, Amen. Hallelujah. These men had the bold audacity to say we're relying on God's will. You see, part of faith is recognizing how sometimes God's will for our life isn't the same as our will. God's will for your life is many times not the same as your will. When you think about it, God could have delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from this situation in really one of three ways. First of all, he could have delivered them from the fire. In other words, no fire. God could have just walked in, changed Nebuchadnezzar's mind and heart, and it had all been over with, no more threat, no more challenge, boom. All right? That's the first thing. Secondly, he could deliver them through the fire. That's actually what he did. <laughs> and when they were in the fire, they were refined. Do you know the only thing that made it out of that fire was faith. 
Do you know the things that were burned up around that fire? It was anything that was against faith. That's why the things that were binding their wrists and their hands together, the, the, the cords, were burned away, but they didn't even smell like smoke. You see, you can have that kind of faith in God that when you go through circumstances that requires you to rely upon His will and, his, and trust Him for what He can do, you'll come through intact in your faith, but the things that may have been placed on you or in your life will be burned away and they're gone. So God chose to deliver them through the fire. Amen, hallelujah. We've all been there, right? He delivered them through the storm, through the fire. You know, they're thinking maybe he's going to miraculously rescue us from these flames. And guess what God did? He miraculously rescued them from those flames. But the third option is an option that we don't even think of. Because God might have delivered them by the fire into his arms. What if, now I'm not changing scripture, but what if after all of this, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been thrown into the fire. They would have evaporated just that quick and been consumed by that fire. Then I'd be talking to you about how. We don't know how God's going to deliver us, but it may be through those circumstances that they're still delivered into the arms of God. Why is it we don't accept that ending? Why is it I don't like that ending? Why is it I don't like to talk about death? And neither do you. Let's be honest. Come on. I'll say amen for you. You see, the reality is this. Our faith becomes sight when it's delivered by the fire into God's presence. You see, here's the reality. You don't have a promise of leaving this building this morning. Neither do I. You don't have the promise that you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and go to work or school or wherever you're going to go. There may be something that happens in all of our lives that delivers us not from the fire or through the fire, but by the fire into his arms. Here's my question. Are you ready? Are you ready? Am I ready? Are we ready? Are we preparing people around us to be ready? Now, I know what you're thinking, Pastor. I thought this was faith promise. It is. But faith has to start. For there to be a promise, there has to be a starting point. And so the first challenge I have for each and every one of us, first of all, as Christians, remember when you started. And remember when you started in this journey of faith, for we walk by faith, not by sight, right? For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. No man can boast, right? Okay, so when you start walking by faith, your faith is going to be tested. Someone here this morning needs to remember you need to stay rooted in God's Word. You need to understand there's wounding in life. You also need to know that we can depend on and remember God's works. But at the same time, there's the reality, the ultimate reality of God's will. Where will you spend eternity? Pastor, where can I spend eternity? By faith, I'm telling you, there's one of two places. There's heaven that God has prepared for you and me, and there's hell that God prepared for the devil and his angels. Do I believe that? wouldn't stand here and tell you that if I didn't. And the reality is when we walk by faith, our faith is going to be tested in the furnace. And I'm encouraging you right now, if you feel the fire, rejoice and praise the Lord. That means you have something genuine that's worth testing and trying. I have people come to me all the time and say, Pastor, I'm facing this and I'm facing that. And I identify with them. I say, but look at the flip side. There's something there the devil's trying to destroy. There's something there that's being refined in this fire, in this, in, in this furnace that you're dealing with. The thing that bothers me is people who walk flippantly through life. And they just think it's about the next entertainment. They think it's about the next video game that comes out. I think it's about the next record that's recorded by their favorite pop star or movie going to hit the silver screen, and the list goes on and on. Those are the guys I worry about because there has to be a genuine faith in order for the fire to hit it. Now, if there's conviction this morning, I want you to know that God's here to save. He's here to redeem. He's here to reclaim. And if you've never, ever been serious about, is there that genuine faith in my life? I want to give you that opportunity this morning to really talk to God and make sure it's there. If you're going through the fire right now, praise Him for it and ask Him, God, what can you teach me as I go through this that's in your will for my life? Father, Lord, in a message like this, we can't finish, we quit. Because I know, God, you're doing business with so many people in so many ways. 
Father, we're all tested and we're tried in our faith. Lord, every single one of us here who are Christians, God, can identify and we can relate to what happens. We know, Lord, that obscurity in the world is so much better because it doesn't draw attention to us. But, Lord, when it does and the attention is on and it's because of truth and your word, Father, would you give us the ability, would you give us the blessings, the encouragement to know how to stand faithfully before you in this time and in this day we're living in. Father, I pray for that one here this morning. That for just a moment, they peeked into their soul. They peeked into their soul and they wondered, is there something there that can be tried by the fire? Is there faith? And I pray for that one here this morning to be honest enough to say, I don't have faith in Jesus Christ. I don't have faith in what God's wanting to do in my life, but I want that. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll speak to them, you'll minister to them as only you can. And I pray, Father, that you'll draw them to a time of prayer with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me? We're going to sing. And I'm going to ask you, if you'd just like to come and pray, just be alone with the Lord. You can come and bow here, or uh, the pews are open here. If you can't bow, you can just sit. Uh, if you want someone to pray with you, if you'll just come and bow here, or you'd want to sit here, if you can't bow, you can just sit right here. Someone will come and pray with you. But the most important thing I want you to think about is how, how's your faith? Surrender all to Him.